Okay, uh, welcome everyone um, to this installment of the School of Geography webinar series. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that those of us who are in Australia are meeting on the unceded lands of various Indigenous peoples, uh, the Jar Jar Wurrung in my case, and the Wurundjeri for many of you. Uh, and I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. So it's a pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Daniel Fitzpatrick. Um, Daniel is professor in the Faculty of Law at Monash University. Uh, his work largely concerns property rights in the context of development. He's made substantial contributions both to scholarship and policy making in this space. <clears throat> in the past, he's worked as land rights advisor to the United Nations in post-conflict East Timor and post-tsunami Aceh. And his recent work concerns the ways in which property systems in climate vulnerable nations respond to the threats of mass human migration. And it's on this topic that he's going to be talking today with a specific focus on the Solomon Islands. So Daniel will be talking for about half an hour, which will leave us plenty of time for Q&A. Uh, if you do have questions for Daniel, please feel free to submit them at any time by pressing the Q&A button on your screen. Um, otherwise, when we get to the Q&A session, you can use the raise hand function and either Ariane or myself will enable you to turn on your microphone and or camera so that you can post your, uh, pose your question to Daniel directly. Um, I'd also like to advise that we're recording today's presentation. So Daniel, welcome. Uh, I'd like to now hand it over to you. All right, thanks very much Trent and thank you Ariane and um, your colleagues for arranging this. Um, I'll share the screen. Um, that's not it. <laughs> Let me go back. Um, all right, there we are. So um, uh, I should say from the outset that uh, this project has been a collaboration with my colleague at Australian National University, uh, Rebecca Johnson, and Rebecca uh, is a lawyer but also a geographer by training and, and she has uh, particular expertise in Solomon Islands. Um, so I'm grateful uh, for her, 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 um, her support uh, along the way. And the project itself arose primarily out of a discovery grant. Um, it, it's part of my future fellowship as well. Um, and uh, of course, because it involves um, field work, there, there's a large number of Solomon Islands who have assisted and I gratefully acknowledge their assistance and I'll mention a few of them as we talk. Um, and then uh, the basic research question that I'm interested in, in, in is how complex property systems respond to uh, mass movements of people caused by escalating climate change. So it's sort of an analytical question, you know, how would, it, how would a complex property system respond to uh, mass migration and displacement um, in the future? Uh, I come from a particular disciplinary perspective. Um, you know, my background is obviously law, but the nature of the law that I've, I've done uh, over the years has meant that I, I've had to grapple with interdisciplinary frameworks and, and you'll see that appear in the presentation. Uh, but I'm particularly interested to, to get sort of feedback from geographers, um, also anthropologists, uh, on, on some of the concepts that I'm presenting and um, how they, these concepts might fit into your your own analytical frameworks and, and you know, there's different terminology uh, and, and all that sort of thing. But it, it's meant to be a, an interdisciplinary discussion from which we, I learn uh, in particular as well. Um, uh, now, what I say is that this question of how a complex property system would respond to escalating movement of people uh, is essentially a problem of governance. So from a property point of view, uh, what I'm particularly interested in is how governance systems ensure or promote collective respect for claims to land, okay? Um, and that's a core governance problem of property. So anyone can claim land, uh, but the key obviously to make it property is uh, a certain degree of uh, social acceptance, if not formal legal acceptance of that claim. So that's the governance problem. And I say that Governance is really central to a lot of these debates about climate adaptation. So, for example, if we look at the link between, you know, climate change and, and violent conflict, you know, one of the questions will be that if, if cl so-called climate migrants, and I'll come to that phrase in a second, uh, 
if they move somewhere and they do get secure tenure, uh, land tenure, or, or access to land, then there's less likely to be uh, violent conflict by, by definition. And there's also less likely to be um, spillover effects, so transnational, further transnational movements of people if, if the uh, migrants or the displaced are receiving secure land rights uh, either nearby or in the urban area, then you know these these negative quote externalities are less likely to occur. So you know I think governance and property and security of land tenure is really part of the picture of the adaptation story. Um, uh, now you have to forgive me while my screen just glitzes out a bit here. Uh, hopefully, are you Trent? Can you tell me if that's a problem at your end? The the um, I'm able to see your slides. I'm, I'm able to see your slides clearly. Okay, and they're clear enough for you. Okay, yeah. um, so it's just a problem for me. <laughs> All right, problem. Just mention it in the chat, please. Yeah, just let us know because I'll go to my other tablet if we need to. Um, now, uh, in terms of analysing um, complex property systems, I'm interested in concepts of polycentricity. So my particular take on polycentricity is that it's uh, that, that the way in which uh, so-called migrants secure um, the land uh, is not only through rights derived from the state that is allocated by the state through processes of law, but you also have a, 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 a range of uh, social norms, you have informal agreements, you have acts of mutual coordination, for example, coordinating around the fact that someone is in possession. Um, and these are all sort of uh, multi-scale processes, right? So they occur at different scales of interaction. They have different spatial construction, different temporal constructions, but they all add together to contribute to this phenomenon of secure land tenure. So it's polycentric in the sense that I'm not just concerned with law and formal allocation from the state, but I'm concerned with how households uh, secure rights for you know household members, how communities secure rights for community members, and then ultimately how these processes interact, all right? Um, now, by definition, in doing so, uh, I, I am looking at property rights, not only as products of law and state grant, but also arising in what could be informal context or even extra legal context, so include formal settlements in urban areas, okay? So it's a broad, it's a broad view of property. Uh, but there's a key notion of polycentricity. So to give you some ideas of what I mean, scale sensitive aspects of tenure security, you know, uh, as we know, most forms of migration, the initial port of call is um, through a family network and the initial access to land acquire, is acquired through a family network. And it might be, as I'm going to show, an allocation of some land uh, that's family land, or, um, or it, may, it may even just be a bit of space within a household. Okay, but that's the, the, the sort of the preliminary point for a lot of migration is the family and kin network and, and that play, plays its part in tenure security. Uh, and then of course we have, um, I can just make my screen work better here. Uh, market mechanisms to secure rights to land. So, you know, you could have acts of sale or you could have the lease of land. Um, and then you could have mechanisms where they actually allocate public land or, or they, they grant you a land title. Um, so these are different illustrations of, uh, of polycentricity. Um, so now the Solomon Islands is obviously uh, just a, a, an iconic, like a lot of the countries, uh, almost all the countries in the Pacific, South Pacific, you know, iconic case of polycentricity in two particular senses. One is that um, most of the Solomon Islands is still classified in a legal sense, as some real land. Okay, so that map, this map shows you that. Um, the areas coloured in red and yellow are um, what's called alienated land. So that's land that uh, was allegedly sold to either to the British administration or to European settlers, um, and, and then fell under the system of, of the registered land titles. Uh, and then all other land is, is by default customary land and governed by uh, custom. Uh, under the Act. Um, now, this is just a formal depiction, but obviously the custom, uh, customary land, alienated land, is dis distinction is central in the Pacific. Um, now, the other type of uh, polycentricity is um, informal settlements. And again, just, just break in if these 
slides aren't clear because uh, unfortunately they're glitzing out of my screen. Um, this is a, a map prepared by uh, Solomon Islander called Reginald Rubin as part of his PhD and then he's been developing this material for some time. And, and it shows the growth of informal settlements um, in, um, let's see if I've got any chat. Okay, it's all fine, cool. Um, yeah, so the growth of informal settlements in Honiara, which is the capital, um, another indicator of, of what I call polycentricity in the governance mechanisms. So what we're going to see is that the informal, informal settlements, you know, the family and kin networks are still very strong governance mechanisms, even though it's in an urban setting. Right? Now, um, um, uh, I, I develop a hypothesis here where um, the, the basic hypothesis is that, if my screen could just become a bit clearer to me, that would help, um, is that these different government mechanisms have different, um, different forms of absorptive limit, okay? Uh, so uh, it's a notion of absorptive limits. I've, I've derived it from studies in governance, um, and it, essentially I derive it and uh, define it in a fairly narrow sense to say that the absorptive limit in the context property is the capacity of a governance mechanism just to secure property rights in circumstances of increasing numbers of participants. Okay, so um, for example, a family and, and a kin network, I think my next slide gives you examples. Um, uh, yeah, is that a family and kin network uh, may absorb a certain number of rel relatives re re who are moving to land uh, claimed by the family or kin. Um, but there are obvious limits to that in, in terms of A, you know, non-relatives, um, uh, um, B, uh, large numbers moving suddenly. Uh, so that's absorb what I call an absorptive limit, right? Um, and, uh, and I know it's, a, it's just a proposed heuristic for an analyzing these complex circumstances. But market mechanisms have absorbed limits as well that some types of agreement are self-enforcing, but typically an agreement needs to be embedded in a system of social norms and, and even law to, to be uh, an effective instrument for securing property rights. Um, and the state itself, and it, it, this is a critical point, but the state itself has absorbed of limits in circumstances for large numbers. And that's just illustrated by the phenomenon of informal settlements, right? Is that what we see in Honiara, like so many places in the, in the global south, so many cities, the most, most poor migrants move to informal settlements. Up to 40% of the population live in defined, what is defined as in, informal zones. Um, and so the state has a certain limit on its capacity to provide secure property rights to these types of migrants. Um, and so at, we have this process through climate change and climate adaptation networks and climate migration where there's increasing focus on the state and increasing demand for the role of the state. But what I'm pointing out is that there's constraints on the state, right? It's really significant in terms of the capacity to provide core components of, of effective adaptation, such as tenure security. So this is this idea of, of absorptive limits um, that, I, that I've been playing around with. Um, so I've just got, there's uh, a slide about the absorptive limits of agreements, uh, absorptive limits of informal settlements. So uh, what I'll show is that in Honiara, there, there are management committees in these informal settlements but their capacity to, man to provide tenure security for members is, you know, it also depend depends on external relations. So it's the management committees draw on family and kin networks, but there's also an external element to their capacity. Um, and then the, the state has absorbed limits as well. Um, for those interested, uh, I'm drawing on concepts from the social ecological systems literature here. Uh, I, I'm particularly interested in unpacking that top right-hand box, which is governance. Um, and, uh, but once you've unpacked governance, to get a full picture of the complexity of these issues, then you would have to consider things like uh, resource units, resource systems, and, and the nature of the actors. Um, but I'm focusing on governance. And so this is our, our, our fieldwork site, uh, our project with Sol the Solomons. Um, you see these arrows there, a number of sites on Malata, uh, Lao Lagoon, uh, top 
top right, then further down on the right are Koi and Nongasilla Islands, um, and then uh, Walunde Island, uh, bottom right, and then to the left, uh, Lilisiana. Uh, and so we've got case studies of people moving uh, from or, or in those contexts. Now, I should say for, at the outset that I try to avoid the whole definitional problem of what a climate great migrant is, um, because, um, you know, as we all know, the multi-causal nature of migration creates enormous difficulties for these sort of legal compartments. Uh, so what we do instead is that we have looked at people moving from areas that are acknowledged as highly vulnerable to the effects of climate change, and particularly uh, sea level rise. Um, and so, you know, I'm saying, quote, climate migrant, because I'm not really that interested in the definitional issue, but more just the the, the consequences of predictions of, of increased migration on governance mechanisms relating to land. Okay. Um, so then we the, in the um, article that we have under consideration by a journal at the moment, um, we, we talk about uh, the absorptive capacity of custom, that's where we start, and the networks of marriage and trade and gift exchange um, provide options for uh, people from these islands that I mentioned. So for example, in Lao Lagoon, where a number of artificial islands, you know, some people are, are able to move to the mainland because of links through their maternal line with the landholding group, the customary landholding group on the mainland. Okay, so there are there are maternal, there are marriage links, also uh, networks of trade and gift exchange, where where that where groups have uh, interconnected over the years, and they provide also some options for movement of, of people. But this is small scale movements, but it's where, where we start. Our case studies also show some limits to custom, particularly the capacity to manipulate narratives of custom, so genealogies, um, historical na narratives of, of affiliation, uh, who's in and who's out. Um, uh, these, these will determine some of the limits of custom as well, uh, particularly as competition for land increases. Uh, there, is, there is increasingly sort of uh, narr manipulation of narratives to sort of cut the networks uh, uh, in order to um, safeguard perceived rights to, to land and resources. Um, and then we had another type of governance mechanism for people to move, and that is uh, group agreement. Now, these are, these are, this is not migration through networks of marriage, but this is migration through a formal or a, a, what appears to be a formal agreement between two groups normally representatives of those groups. And so the, the potential as an instrument for movement of people is clear. Um, the first case study is this island of Walande um, off the coast of, uh, of, of Malata and Little Malata. Um, and this is an island, it's an, it's an artificial island, so it was built up out of coral blocks um, uh, many decades ago. And then, and then we tell the story in the in the paper. But uh, the the short version is that over time, the foundations of the island actually became damaged. Mangroves were cut down around the island. It became increasingly subject to the influence of of wind, wind and waves. And and so th this was the result. Uh, and so these people have moved this island. They've moved from this island to an area of land on the mainland which they claimed by virtue of an agreement going back to the 1950s. Uh, now, you won't be able to read this agreement, but it's, it's, it's a fascinating study in, um, in a sort of intergroup agreement. There was a chief on one side, a purported chief, uh, you know, purporting to agree to grant land, quote, in perpetuity for, to, uh, to the, member, the residents of Wollande Island. Um, and um, the limits arise from this type of agreement because, A, uh, there's a lot of tension now between the two groups. Um, some some of the neighbouring members of the neighbouring landowning group uh, query whether whether they were actually transferring rights that in perpetuity, which is a, a really tough concept in this context. Whether the chief had the authority to do so. Often, chief, so called chiefs um, do these sort of agreements in order to um, buttress and, and 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 lift up their own authority. Uh, and also there are questions that, that, that arise where you've got uh, this sort of almost European notion of a, a land agreement with fixed boundaries. And then you put that in the middle of a customary context. The problem is that there's no mechanism 
to manage demographic growth, right? You, you, you're looking at the subsistence society by and large. And so as new households form, the, the, the area of land that the community lives in stays the same. So there's um, significant problems of overcrowding uh, and that's caused some spillover effects. The other agreement we look at is, is on Lilisiana, which is um, on the left-hand side of Malata. And I'll just start reading up it. So there's the beach there at Lilisiana. Um, it's, it's, um, it's, it's just on the edge of the, ca the provincial capital, Lauki. That's a view of water showing how low-lying it is. And it is, there's a lot of inundation uh, through this community uh, at high tide. Now, they're a group that, are, are, by and large, right, um, ha had moved from an island nearby that had been that it itself had um, ha had ha had uh, sort of um, dropped. There's there's old photos that it, for various reasons it had dropped um, very significantly. It lost a lot of land mass, and so they had moved some time ago to this area through sort of agreement with the neighbouring customary group. But this is a very contested space. Um, now there is a proposal. Uh, to that again by a purported leader, a representative of the local landholding group, um, to move the people of Lilisiana to another area of land, um, and um, it's a quite a formal proposal, and it includes um, a provision that says that the people who move will receive a statutory that is just rights to land. So in other words, there'll be a process of conversion, co converting co customary land to alienated land under the Land and Titles Act, and these people will get registered um, titles as climate migrants and, yeah, quote unquote, and that these registered titles are the mechanism by which they get property security, right? Now, um, now the problem with this in, in the Solomons is that it's a particular mechanism of formalization of customary land. It's, it generates a lot of disputes a lot of abuse of power by they called chiefs because these these chiefs become the registered trustees of the land who hold on behalf of um, uh, uh, of their group. Um, but it, so again, it's the absorptive limit of intergroup agreements in a context of customary land. But in this case, could then subsequent converting to alienated land. And then we look at Honiara. So the interesting thing about Honiara is that it's actually land that is registered in the name of the Commissioner of Lands. Um, so Trent, I see there's a bit happening on the chat function, so just break in if you, if you need to uh, interrupt me. No, um, but Honiara, no. it's registered land in the name of the Commissioner of Lands. This also is a contested uh, arrangement, but technically in a legal sense, um, the Commissioner of Lands has indefeated title to the whole town lands of Haniara, and then the Commissioner grants titles to uh, applicants, and they're, they're called, largely called uh, fixed-term estates. Now, this system has, is a paradigmatic case of uh, absorptive limits in the sense that um, uh, for reasons of cost, it's just too expensive, for reasons of bureaucratic incapacity, uh, and dysfunction, the the um, the land office is not able to um, uh, manage even what's called. There's a system of temporary occupation licences, which is fallen into disuse. They're, they're not able to manage the amount of people that have been moving into Honiara, particularly after the ten, after the tensions, right? Returning after the tensions, uh, and so 35 to 40 percent of the of the um, of the city of the population city live in. in the settlements, they don't bother trying to apply for formal registered title. They would probably get them if they applied, but they're expensive and takes too long, etc., etc., etc. And they have an institutional alternative. So, depth case of absorbent limits. Now, we've got a we have we've looked at a number of settlements in Honiara. This one um, is the Lord Howe settlement, and that's migrants from uh, Ontong Java. And this is a key point: is that as in most places in the Pacific, these settlements at least originally arose out of migration from a particular area. So they still have very strong customary based mechanisms for the management of land in their, in the informal settlement. Um, and um, so this will draw into the point that I'm about to make, which is that these are nested arrangements, these governance mechanisms, particularly in an urban setting. 
where you have a family and kin sort of network. So if you're from Montong, Java, you moved to this area, or historically you did, and your family and kin put you up. In the early days, they would even subdivide their land and give you a little bit of land to build a house. Um, but then there are processes of community management that overlay that through these management committees. And then and on top of that, nested within a system of law and, uh, and um, the overarching rights of the commissioner of lands. So it's a nested system of governance in the uh, informal settlements. And, and we really need to understand how these react to increased numbers of people to, re to get a true analytical picture of property systems and, and climate migration. So there's a, a, a picture of um, on top of Java showing the vulnerability. Another site we looked at is um, the, Lao, the Lao people's settlement um, on the other side of the river from the from the Lord on from Java settlement. Um, uh, this is the Mat Mataniko settlement, and um, again, this is historically a site for people from Lao Lagoon, which is that area in the north uh, east of Malata that I showed you in the original map. There's an artificial island in in, in uh, Lao Lagoon, and it's it, it's illustrating this point I'm making is that okay, I'm not trying to establish that they are climate threats, but I can clearly establish that these are areas of high climate vulnerability, and this is where these people are moving, right? Um, and as I say, their initial means of uh, gaining access to land is through the family and kin networks. Um, these are extra legal arrangements because, as you see in this photo, um, the main problem actually is, uh, in, in a legal sense, right, is that you know, the subdivisions are occurring without approval. And so uh, uh, it, under the under the Top Land and Titles Act, in order to have a property right at law, you need to have a reg it needs to be a registered right, uh, and now these subdivisions are ha happening in a way, uh, and uh, so they're not going to be able to get a registered right um, without overcoming uh, that issue. Um, with the uh, the Lao settlement, um, it's now at, and the Lord House settlement they're now overcrowded, um, and so there's no definitely no room for new houses, uh, and, and but even the you know moving into the family household. Uh, it's very crowded. And so this is a, a settlement we looked at uh, down uh, the ridge from a place at St. George College. And um, here what you had is some people from Laos uh, just started to construct um, housing along the edge of a swamp area. So this is, again, it is a definitely an informal settlement. There's no government permission to do this. Um, it's obviously immensely very vulnerable land. But they've bootstrapped sort of some of the customary mechanisms from Lao in terms of putting in the coral blocks uh, you can see on the there uh, and the narratives of you know first possession uh, to try and support their tender security claims. But they, they're disconnected from law, uh, absolutely entirely. And and, and, and um, the informal settlement at, at uh, that historically has helped Lao, Lao people at Mataniko River. It's too crowded, so they've moved out because it's too crowded. And it's sort of like a process of ad hoc settlement, if you like, but I need to be careful about terms like that. Uh, obviously very vulnerable. Third site is Coe Hill. And now Coe Hill was, is a more longstanding informal settlement. Uh, again, like the Lord House settlement and the Lao settlement, um, you know, the, 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 the bedrock of governance is still family and kin networks, but it's a more heterogeneous settlement than those two other ones. It's been there for long, been much more into marriage. Um, and they, so they have a management committee that is, uh, that is elected. There's, there's no connection with the government here still, uh, but the management committee has played a very strong role in, in um, you know, overlaying the governance mechanisms based on custom and family. Uh, people have planted flowers to denote boundaries. The management committees control um, the boundaries of little air, sub areas in the in the settlement, um, uh, and so again, that's sort of another governance mechanism to secure rights to land. But as I said, it's disassociated from the, and so the effect is when the flash floods hit in 2011, um, the uh, the the settlement was uh, particularly down by the river here was destroyed, and um, the the people uh, were displaced. Um, there was a prohibition on return to this settlement under a city ordinance for returned, which again goes to this absorptive limits of the state point. Uh, a number of other people have, have also relocated to a place called April Hill, 
uh, and I can talk about that as well. But my key absorptive limits here is that the, the, the Coa Hill sediment was actually really quite a powerful and resilient uh, reception site for, quote, climate migrants over the years. Um, managed access to land surprisingly well, even though they have a, uh, a, there, there is a sort of a narrative of lawlessness in these areas. But in fact, when you drilled it, you know, they've managed migration and access to land very well. But they're disconnected from the state because they're classified as extra legal, particularly down by the edge of the river here. And so when they were displaced by the flash floods, um, the, tenures, the insecurity of their tenure became apparent because the government then said, well, you guys were informal. You were not supposed to be there, particularly by the river. We're not going to allow you to return. Now, there's no compensation for acquisition of property because they're defined as illegal. Uh, and, and so that's the absorptive limit of the governance mechanism here is that in a nested sense, not associated with the state. Uh, and that's where, uh, where the problems have arisen for Coe Hill. So we draw a, a number of conclusions about you know, absorptive limits. And, you know, I've, I've sort of summarised two of them there for custom uh, and then for law. But the main point I want to get to, and, and I'll finish, is that um, what really comes out of it is that, we, you know, it's a certain analytical frame. It's a heuristic, right? It's not meant to be a comprehensive frame. It's a means of analysis. Uh, what comes out of it is that, you know, we can look, isolate these different governance mechanisms, as I've done, as we have done in the paper, um, and look at their absorptive capacity and how they react uh, to increased numbers of people in different ways and at different scales of interaction. So custom and family networks and kin networks and networks of gift exchange react to increasing numbers in a certain way, right? Um, then when you get a situation where groups enter into agreements with each other, those agreements also react to increasing numbers or the context of those agreements react to increasing numbers in a certain way. And that is a spatial dimension and a temporal dimension. And then, of course, when you get to the urban setting and the interaction with law, these settlements, informal settlements, again, they react to increasing numbers in a certain way, in a different in a certain spatial temporal context, right? So it's a way of looking at uh, different governance mechanisms and understanding how they operate at scale uh, in, in, in a predicted future of uh, human mobility. But more significantly, perhaps, what the analysis shows as well, derived from the case study material, is that, of course, these governance mechanisms are nested, right? There are networks of interactions among these governance mechanisms. So founding kin networks are, are, are nested in a community settlement. Um, agreements to build land or lease land are nested within uh, potentially a legal context, but certainly a community context, right? Um, so what we suggest is that, um, uh, and this is contrary to your classic depictions of property law and how property law provides security for people, what we suggest is that, um, is that if we look at it from a systems point of view, the absorptive capacity of a complex property system is more than the sum of its constituent parts, right? And um, uh, so even though what I've done gives you sort of an insight, I think um, a key lesson from it, particularly in sort of a normative policy sense, is that um, is the way in which these, these different mechanisms, uh, the degree to which they are in a networked relationship with other governance mechanisms is a key determinant of how a property system will manage climate migration, how absorptive, how adaptive it will be. And um, uh, so the normative conclusion, we explore this in our paper and its notion of adaptive property law, is that um, instead of your classic sort of World Bank model of property security arising out of registered titles, which is just absurd in this type of context, uh, that the normative frame should really be operating at a level of strengthening the relationships between these sites of governance. So, for example, the informal settlements, um, the insecurity of those informal settlements, sure, they have a problem managing larger numbers of, of in-migrants, no question about it. But the insecurity, as the Coa Hill case shows, is really external because they're disassociated from the state. 
because of the operation of a colonial land law. Um, so what I'm talking about is a different type of legal structure um, that, that to, to, to draw in informal settlements much more into networks of land um, And similarly, when we look at this interface between custom and law, where you get agreements that formalise rights in this certain way in Solomon Islands, and there's different ways across the Pacific, that we really need to look at that link as well, because that network link, right, the way in which custom and law interact is critical to the absorptive capacity of the system as well. And definitely in Solomon Islands, this notion that you um, formalise customary land through by registering trustees, these representatives of the group, is, is just a disastrous way to create absorptive capacity in your system. So I think that the heuristic we're proposing also has policy implications, and I'll be happy to talk about those more. Uh, and I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Okay, thanks so much, Daniel. That was really fascinating. A lot of really interesting themes to pick up on there. Um, we've had a couple of questions submitted through the Q&A, but um, I'd ask anybody else who'd like to, to just press the Q&A button and, and write your question in, or just use the raise hand function um, and we can bring you up to ask your question directly. Um, so the first question is from Ian. Uh, Ian asks, uh, when people migrate to Honiara, what happens to the land they leave behind? Um. Well, I mean, the, it's, it's controlled by fam members of the family and members of the customary group. So um, they're moving from a collective, a okay. formal collective land holding. Yeah. Right. So it's not like the whole collective is, is migrating and leaving. leaving land. Yeah, that's right. No, that's right. Yeah. And okay. in fact, they want to retain those connections. So when you see people mi migrating, for example, from Ontong, Java, you know, always people will stay behind. Um, to maintain that connection. Right, okay. Um, all right, uh, we have a question from, uh, we've got Rifki. Uh, I might ask Rifki to, to pose this question to you. Hello, Rifki, are you there? Hi, I'm right here. Can you hear me? Yes, yep, we can. Oh, great. Uh, I have uh, one question. Um, according to you, according to your findings, the Core Hill uh, case, is a perfect, uh, is a sort of better system in which the climate migrants actually can somehow cooperate with the already inhabitants there and ensure that there are some sort of order in their new uh, quote unquote lands. Uh, according to your research, has there been any kind of efforts made by the central government to actually replicate what is happening in Coa Hill and ensuring that you know, all of these quote unquote outside of the law climate migrants are actually now incorporated into the system so that whenever their quote unquote polycentricity uh, informal agreements breaks down, they are no longer displaced. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Rifki. So um, just some quick replies. Uh, first, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say it's a perfect, a perfect system, but I think um, uh, it is, it is, um, I think, a very powerful finding that the that over the decades the settlement has managed to allocate land in a fairly secure way to people who've moved into the settlement through these quote informal unquote mechanisms. It's not perfect in any way, and and um, uh, but but uh, you know I think the, the the internal governance of informal settlements is is a powerful uh, governance absorb you know absorptive governance mechanism for for migration. Um, second point is that, um, yeah, the, the system, I don't have, didn't have time to go, but it has been with temporary occupation licenses. So the, the, the land that's not right next to the river there is subject to the temporary occupation license issued by the, but the government sort of stopped managing that system um, uh, for a variety of reasons. And again, it goes to the, the, the limits of the state. Uh, so this is part of the problem with saying, you know, um, how do we, how do we, how does the government recognise this process is better? Has certain to do it, and so really, I think it's um, uh, in the paper we talk about different sort of legal instruments you could apply, but ultimately we're looking at it. It's sort of like a nested mechanism where you you um, you 
the law provides space for the internal mechanisms to work. Um, and one of the consequences of that is that when they were displaced by the flash flood, um, you know, you can debate whether um, people should be prohibited from return to hazardous zones. It's one of the huge policy debates, obviously. But I think as a minimum, um, I, you know, I think they should have received compensation. If you've been in possession for, you know, generations, uh, you should receive compensation. So there's a tool to do that in, in the legal sense. So it's sort of a complicated answer, but um, that's what I'd say. Okay, um, we have a question from Olivia. Hi Olivia, are you there? Yeah. Hi. Yeah, Hi, um, thanks so much for that. Uh, it's really interesting to see, see what's happening. I was just wondering if you can comment on what is happening with managing land for food growing in the context of these resettlements. Have there been any interesting issues that stood out amongst the case studies you've been looking at with respect to this? Have you got that trend? Yep. Thanks. Sorry, were you able to hear that, Daniel? No, I, I couldn't do that, Trent. Oh, okay. Uh, so Olivia was asking about what's going on in relation to food growing in these informal settlements. Oh, well, um, I mean, there's a little bit, obviously, in, um, in Coe Hill, um, you know, little, little gardens, um, but a place like um, the Lao settlement, uh, almost none. Um, so that's a fishing village. Um, so they're relying on on you know market uh, food markets. So there's not there's not a lot of food. And again, it's a question of space and goes to the limits of of these settlements to absorb you know increasing numbers of people. Okay, um, I might uh, ask John to pose. John's got his hand up. Uh, thanks, Trent. Hi, Daniel. How are you going? Um, yeah, good. Thanks, John. Thanks, heaps. Uh, I just so appreciate uh, your work and, and you just get to the heart of, you know, one of the really core issues in adaptation of the Pacific. I think that nobody really, you know, it's even really hard to know how to to come to this conversation. And, it, you know, of course, I always have lots of things I want to say and ask. Um, I, I will say you're the most post-structuralist, post-modern lawyer I've ever met, and you're quite likely to be fired for that kind of anti-legal nonsense that you talk about. Um, yeah. one, of the, I mean, one of the things I kind of want to, I guess I want to ask the, I want to ask the question, what would be the points of intervention? And I think you sort of started to address that in your, in your talk. But I guess the other question is, so if they're muddling through, yeah. what if you just did nothing? I mean, I mean, what if, you know, this sort of mix of, of, of mechanisms is sort of working and you get this kind of quasi-market situations and the state is in and out and the customary mechanisms and it sort of works and, you know, and I can think of other places in the Pacific where it sort of works, heaps of yeah. social transaction costs and talking through the night and latent conflict and so on. So, so I'm sort of, you know, there's always a danger that you try and kind of pull the levers of the system to somehow try and optimise it in terms of future conditions. But what if you actually did nothing? What would happen, do you think? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I think, um, you know, it, it, the, the do no harm principle is still pretty strong um, in land, pretty strong land there's no doubt about it. Um, uh, the system is muddling through and, and, and I think a key finding is that, you know, the idea that law or state intervention and government mechanic programs can, can make a difference um, really needs to be assessed in the light of the fact that they can't command the number of informal settlements in the city. Um, so um, one of the points um, I'd like to make elsewhere is that I think the, the emerging architecture of sort of climate governance and disaster governance um, is really sort of um, bootstrapping the state uh, as, as the central provider of services. And, and I think the, find, the finding of our research is that you really have to be you know, skeptical about that. And then the flow on effect is that policy proposals should be assessed against the fact that, um, you know, the, the, the limits of the state in, in these processes need to be very well understood. But that said, I don't think that doing nothing really an option. Um, uh, you know, I think the, the system, my feeling, and I'm not an ex, you know, a deep expert in Solomon's, but, you know, I, I think um, 
migration to Guadalcanal and, and, and the Honiara and the formation of informal settlements and informal land markets on the edge of Honiara are really central to what happened in the tensions. Um, and, you know, we are going to look at you know, large numbers of people moving to Honiara or if there's a huge rapid onset natural disaster or some spike in people, you know, I think the, these notions of absorptive capacity will show that, um, that they will start to break down under the pressures of uh, increased numbers. Um, uh, I, one of the implications of what we're saying is that you know, I, I, I think these highly interventionist government uh, programs and legal interventions should be treated with but there are other tools. Well, you know, I think the whole system of law that it was inherited from British administrations needs to be rethought. Um, this idea that you have to get a property right at law, you have to register the title, is just a, a, a legacy of co colonisation and um, it, it really, really needs to be thinking the old common law principles about possession being a property right should be resurrected. Um, in Australia, if you're a quote squatter and the, and the government resumes your land, expropriates your land, you get compensation because possession is a property right. Now these, these principles have been lost uh, in, in not just in the South Pacific. Um, I, I also think the interface between custom and law uh, will need to be, deserves to be rethought that I think informal dealings in customary land will increase uh, with more movements of people. And yet the, the way in which the law is structured is colonial inheritance of questions on alienation of customary land. Uh, and so it drives this informality. So in PNG in particular, there's quite a thriving informal land in custom land. Um, and that's the nature of land markets. You know, law, law has to adapt to the reality for the Solomon's, you know, to formalise, to have a dealing in customary land, there's this, this, the, the government acquire land first from the customary landholding group and then allocate registered titles to members of that group or to the um, trustees on the group. Now, the old system derived from the British based on this prohibition on alienation of customary land but it, it, it is an incredibly narrow mechanism uh, to manage the interface. But, uh, there are um, sort of adaptive response we talk about in the paper. Uh, I, I think they're, they're, I still think they're worth exploring because uh, I don't think the muddling through uh, is going to be enough. Daniel, just, just picking up on that point of doing nothing, is, is there not also a social justice concern that perhaps relatively powerful actors within the informal settlements might be better positioned to make claims for land? Um, yeah, with, without question. Um, and I think one, you know, we're covering such a complex issue so quickly. Um, you know, one of the issues is, uh, you know, the gend gendered nature of rights, um, uh, that you know what Rebecca's Monson's uh, research shows is that once you get a new space or a new arena negotiation of rights, it tends to be dominated by male actors. Um, uh, you know, I talk about property in sort of terms of sort of exclusive possession um, and secure rights for housing, um, but of course, property is much more complex than that and it encompasses uh, co-ownership rights between spouses, uh, future interests of children under inheritance, um, you know, leaseholder arrangements, uh, neighbourhood restricted covenants in a settlement easements. Um, so um, there's no question that this idea of nested governance needs to grapple with the uh, potential equity implications. Um, the, the, the issue always is how, right? Because if, if, if you've got limits of law, then that's going to affect the way in which you potentially intervene. And that's just a fine grained process of program analysis back monitoring. Um, uh, but um, yeah, you know, I think that some type of interventions uh, are necessary, but I think you need a good analytical frame to guide them. And there's no doubt about that. And, I don't see that at the moment. I just think a, a lot of just off the shelf um, stuff derived from other contexts uh, 
Um, so there's a need, but I don't think we know the way. Right. Okay, we've had quite a few questions submitted through the Q&A, so that's great. Um, Tobias asks, uh, do international actors play a role here? NGOs, aid agencies, external experts, et cetera. And if so, how do they shape these legal systems? And how are they received locally? Yeah, really interesting question, Tobias, and that's sort of a further dimension of, of my research. Um, the international actors are becoming increasingly important. Um, what we have is this emerging intersectionality of, 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 of international governance in these in these areas. So we have um, obviously the development structures uh, and they're intersecting now with the uh, the disaster risk reduction crew and the, all their uh, principles and standards and frameworks and then the climate governance um, that's coming in and so the national adaptation and uh, national action plans for adaptation and integrating uh, climate change into to, disaster risk planning and, and you know, this um, is an enormous emerging architecture. Um, uh, but at the same time, those, that architecture is intervening into a regulatory structure that is derived from colonisation, essentially, right? So you still have a system of sovereign nation states and in relation to property, they have exclusive jurisdiction over uh, the legal regulation of property in their, in their territory, right? Um, and then the state has certain obligations under international human rights law, but the sovereignty of the state is still the, the, the core regulatory building block, okay? Um, so you've got this emerging architecture of, uh, of, of programs and standards and, you know, um, at the international level, but then they're overlaying this system of sovereignty. So that means that the intersection points vary and it, it depends on context. Solomon's has been uh, a number of attempts to um, strengthen land administration through uh, AusAid and largely unsuccessful. Uh, you also, there was an attempt by the EU to develop a relocation policy, also unsuccessful. Um, how does it play out at the local level? Um, well, I think they're pretty disassociated, um, you know, from, from, from the state and from the international actors. But the emerging uh, architecture of governance at the international is really something that uh, is becoming increasingly influential. Yeah. Okay, I think we'll just have time for one more question. Um, so apologies for those who didn't get the chance to have their question posed. Perhaps uh, you can be in touch with Daniel by email. Um, so I'm going to ask Sangeeta's question, which is, do you have informal markets developing opportunistically based on a range of informal forms of ownership and occupation, not registered titles. Um, in other words, do you have something to say here about how markets reshape absorb absorptive capacity? Yeah, wow, well, good, what an interesting point. Um, yeah, so the informal markets are, are, are just a, a fact of life in, in all these, um, what I call polycentric contexts and, um, uh, you know, people sell land, people lease land, and, and you do get documentation, uh, but it, it does tend to have an extra legal quality, particularly when you have what's called a, a, a torrent system of title registration as they do in Solomon's, um, Solomon Islands. Um, is it formal markets definitely provide sort of fences and pathways for uh, absorptive capacity? Um, uh, and, you know, fine-grained study of, of um, the actual mechanisms by which people transfer land in these informal settlements is really important and it's not really covered. I've, I try to get some examples of the documentation used. Um, but I think the broader point is that it goes to this point about adaptive law is that, um, you know, under the, the, the system of Torrens title registration that's inherited by Solomon Islands, which is originally from Australia, um, uh, the only way to transfer, create or transfer a property interest in land uh, at law is to use the prescribed documentation and then to register. Um, so what it does is relegates really a rich system of, of arrangements uh, to a status of uh, disassociation from the state. Um, uh, there are abuses, there are conflicts, uh, but at the same time, it, it's quite resilient. Um, so 
you know, I think it is an element of the capacity which needs more study. I think that's a really good point. Okay, now before we wrap up, um, Daniel, could you perhaps tell us uh, where we can access the paper that you've been referring to? A few people in the chat have been asking. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, look, I'm happy to provide it by email. It's, it's under consideration by a journal called Regulation and Governance. Uh, it's a revise and resubmit, so I'm waiting to hear. So, you know, obviously within that those parameters, uh, I'm happy to share a, um, a, a draft PDF. Uh, if people email, I'll, I'll provide them with that. Um, but I, I do want to emphasize uh, the role of Rebecca Bodson uh, in, in the work. Uh, and also uh, Solomon Island, uh, our friends and colleagues, um, and including including in terms of those some of those images that I provided, you know, that they, they were taken by them and, and are subject to, to the program. Okay. All right. Well, thanks once again, Daniel, for a fantastic talk. I know you've um, stimulated a lot of people's brains here, but so many questions in the Q&A. Um, hopefully we can continue the conversation via email. Uh, okay, so we'll wrap up there. Yeah. Um, I'll just let everybody know that next week's seminar will be by Jeff Garmany, who will be talking about public housing and downward rating in Rio de Janeiro. So I hope you can join us for that. Okay, thanks everyone. See you next week. Thanks, Dan. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.